Hello, everybody. Good evening. My name is Jane Ransom, and I'm the executive director of the American Brain Foundation. I really want to thank you and welcome you to tonight's uh, virtual salon on humanism in neurology. And before I introduce our uh, host for the night, Gordon, Dr. Gordon Smith, I just want to uh, remind you that the American Brain Foundation has a vision of life without brain disease, and uh, we know we can get there by bringing patients, I mean, by bringing donors and researchers together, and patients and caregivers, to make uh, curing brain disease a cause and to start that with research. So we're, we raise money for research and we give uh, millions of dollars to research on brain disease. And uh, we know that the field is moving forward and will keep moving forward with our help. So tonight I want to introduce our host for the night, Dr. Gordon Smith, who is a professor and chair of the Department of Neurology at Virginia Commonwealth University. And prior to that, he served as vice chair for research and chief of the division of neuromuscular medicine and director of the Jack Hedigen uh, Laboratory at the University of Utah. And his interest is uh, in peripheral neuropathy in diabetes and obesity. And he's got a particular interest in biomarker development and novel clinical trial design in peripheral neuropathy, but that's his day job. The other thing that he's really important for is he's been our uh, former uh, very important uh, board member and officer of the American Brain Foundation. He's currently a member of our research advisory committee and he's also served on the board of directors and on many committees of the American Academy of Neurology, our research partner that we work with very closely in, in making grants to research. And he's also one of the people who spearheaded the Ted Burns Fund, which is the T Ted Burns Humanism in Neurology Fund, which is, the, uh, which is sort of the birth mother of the award that we're talking about tonight. So I wanna thank you very much, Gordon, and let you take it away. Well, thanks, Jane, for a really great introduction. Um, and uh, it's great to see so many people here. I'm looking at the, uh, the list of participants and see a lot of uh, friends and familiar names. So welcome to tonight's event. And I, I guess I want to set the tone for this by emphasizing that this is really a celebration. It's a, a celebration of Ted Burns, and it's also a celebration of this year's recipient, Dr. Barbara Geiser, with, who, with whom we'll talk a great deal later on. And, and this is meant to be interactive. And this is a straight up Zoom, which everyone is familiar with. Please remember to unmute yourself when you talk. I'm sure I'll make that mistake later. But please, uh, if you uh, want to speak or chime in or tell an anecdote about Ted or Barbara, uh, ask a question, please feel free to do so. Our run of show really will be some introductions. I'm going to talk a little bit about Ted. I'll introduce you all to people who you already know, which is Stacy Clardy, who everyone knows, I know, and then Dr. Geiser, and then we'll we'll talk a little bit amongst ourselves, but open it up as soon as you like for you to participate in the conversation. This is really meant to be your opportunity to interact with Stacy and Barbara uh, and others and, and celebrate Ted, what he represents and what Barbara uh, represents. And so uh, with that, maybe I'll talk a little bit about how we ended up um, creating this award and why we ended up creating this award. I think most of you know who Ted Burns is, and I can give you a brief introduction for those of you who don't. Ted is a, a professor of neurology at UVA. Ted's from Kansas City uh, and a big, big Royals fan. He went to the university there both for his undergraduate degree and took his medical degree there and then went to UVA where he uh, 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 completed his neurology residency in a neuromuscular CMP fellowship. Uh, Ted and I kind of followed each other around. Uh, I went to undergraduate at UVA and then to Mayo. He did uh, medical school or residency there, and then went to Mayo to do a peripheral nerve fellowship uh, with uh, Jim Dick. And then it was at Leahy for a while before coming back to uh, UVA and rose to the ranks. He's a Harrison Distinguished Teaching Professor 
uh, at UVA. Um, he's uh, widely cited, widely published, has uh, deep expertise in numerous areas of neuromuscular medicine, uh, has a real passion for uh, developing um, uh, quality of life, uh, patient-reported outcome measures for um, a variety of different neuromuscular diseases. He's a master educator, won numerous awards, uh, both locally and uh, nationally, internationally. He's a member of the Academy of Distinguished Educators at UVA. He's won the Dean's Teaching Award of Excellence. He's a master educator. Uh, he's been vice chair of the department. He leaps tall buildings in a single bound. Uh, and he's done all the things that one expects of someone of his stature. He's the uh, recipient of the 2018 Distinguished Researcher Award from the AANAM. And all of that would be worthy of acknowledgement. And in fact, the last award I, I mentioned is uh, one of the major American Association of Neuromuscular and Electrodiagnostic Medicine Research Awards. And the AAN and other uh, professional organizations have a lot of these. They're very important. And, uh, we're in an unparalleled time of uh, therapeutic development and technological development and neurology and all of medicine. And it's uh, important that we celebrate people like Ted for their enormous contributions. But um, I think if there's a theme for tonight and something I really look forward to talking to Barbara about and Stacy is I think that that's not enough. Uh, and in fact, there's a risk in focusing so much on technology and the marvels of modern medicine that we lose our connection to the people we're serving. And, and Ted has been passionate about that in so many ways in his academic career, focusing on quality of life uh, uh, and focusing on advocacy. I know Ted very well from uh, working with him on drug pricing advocacy, and we'll talk about advocacy here today, he's been focused on innovation and education and the podcast, which I, we can't do something that has Ted Burns' name near it without talking about the podcast. And Stacy's here, so you're, you're all going to be expected to partake of the podcast in a minute, and she'll direct you in the right place. Um, and and I, I think the, the last piece I'll say before maybe asking some others to comment a little bit about Ted is um, his ability to inspire other people in his passion for humanism and, and, and really supporting patient-centeredness. I, I felt inspired with him and pushed by him. Um, I, I routinely get um, you know, exhortations from Ted to you know, carry on the fight on various things. And uh, it's really inspired me in my career. He's uh, you know, an incredibly courageous advocate. And I, I think uh, what's been rewarding to me in seeing this award thrive now, this is our third year running, doing it is each of the recipients is a chip off of the old Ted, so to speak. They, they, they are very much like Ted in the work they're doing in different ways and inspiring all of us. And you'll, if you haven't already been inspired by Barbara, I guarantee you will later on. But maybe I can call in a couple of other people who know Ted. Um, I think this is a free, free space to maybe tell a humorous anecdote if you want, or if you want to keep it straight, just what you find inspiring about this. Jeff Ratliff is on the Zoom. Jeff, could you unmute yourself? Maybe you could make a few comments. Yeah. Um, so hi, everybody. I'm Jeff Ratliff. I, um, I met Ted. So I was a, a UVA neurology resident. Um, so I met Ted um, when I was a medical student interviewing for residency. And I, I still remember sort of a, a few things. Um, so I'm in his office, um, and as best I can recall on in the interview trail, Ted was the only program director who interviewed applicants with his feet up on the table in his in his office, uh, just sort of lean back, very, you know, there are just a, a very direct approach. And at one point, we were, um, we were talking, and he pulled out um, his, his copy of, of Bradley and Daroff, this, you know, for those unfamiliar, this two volume large um, neurology text, you know, sort of tome. And I was just talking about sort of his approach to sort of his earnest approach to, to learning neurology and, and he opens it up. And it's clear that he has read this book cover to cover um, and highlights notes in the margins and he's just leafing through. But there was never a, a sort of, as I said, sort of a pretense of superiority or, you know, I know everything in this book or anything like that. It was just a, um, a, an earnestness of, of I want to get better at, at what I do and, and I, I devote my time and my effort and my energy and I sort of, 
I'm, he, it was clear he was regimented, but not again in a sort of imposing or intimidating way. Although as a med student, I was a little intimidated, but, um, and it was, it was just this great juxtaposition of a guy who clearly was, was passionate and, and earnest and, and hardworking. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, had his feet up on the table and wanted to have an atmosphere that was relaxed and direct. I think he was the only program director as well on my interview trail who cursed at some point during an interview, but not in a, you know, never in a, an offensive way, just sort of, you know, threw it in there as a, as a casual way. And I, I, I've been, I've been lucky. I mean, I was, you know, this was, this was over a decade ago that, that I had that first interaction with Ted and, and I've been lucky to, um, obviously trained under him at UVA, um, and even after graduating, um, Ted was gracious and, and, you know, it meant a lot that he put trust in me to, uh, sort of bring me in on the podcast team and, and to sort of bring me into that leadership group along with Stacy and, um, anybody who, who knows Ted knows that, um, he doesn't go you know, probably half an hour without thinking about the podcast in some capacity about what it can do and how we can make it better. And and Stacy and I will tell you that those random thoughts are often um, coming into our phones at, at those random half hours throughout the day. And that's, that's, that's great. But it's, you know, to know how passionate he is about it. Um, and then to know that he sort of, you know, trusted me to sort of take on this, this mantle of his is, is really sort of, um, it's an honor um, knowing Ted and, and knowing everything he stands for that Gordon touched on and that others would touch on here. So, um, yeah, there you go. Jeff, that's great. We'll talk more about, I think, some of these themes as the, uh, the hour goes along. Um, I'm just reflecting uh, some of my early interactions with Ted at Muscle Study Group uh, drinking rather heavily, I might add, that he, he is a wine distributor, as some of you may know, and he would, he would show up at MSG. He would drive. To, to Buffalo, outside Buffalo, with a car full of wine and liquor, <laughs> and, uh, cigars and the whole thing. And so um, <clears throat> it's great hearing the interview tale. Um, uh, Stacy, maybe I can, um, and others, please chime in. But Stacy, uh, let me introduce you. Maybe you can talk a little bit about Ted, and then we can really get to the meat of it and talk with Barbara. So uh, for in the off chance, there's someone who doesn't know who Dr. Clardy is. Stacy is an associate professor of neurology at my former institution, the University of Utah, where she has really risen to stardom. She runs the autoimmune neurology program there. She's an accomplished clinician scientist. She's leading the first large scale trial that I know of, of uh, a therapeutic agent for NMDA encephalitis, which is super exciting. Uh, and there's a plug in here for the Commitment to Cures event at uh, the AAN annual meeting that we're gonna have uh, momentarily. And, and, and I think Stacy knows Ted uh, in a large part through the uh, the podcast, and she's I think uh, someone who I've known Stacy for a long time now embodies the the principles we've been talking about. So Stacy, let me just uh, hand it over to you to say a few words, maybe talk a little bit about Ted, and then uh, we can introduce Barbara. Yeah, uh, thanks, thanks for <laughs> the overly generous introduction. No, this is great, and and I love that that this this brings everybody together um, every year. Um, uh, I didn't train at UVA. Um, I did meet Ted on the interview trail, though I did interview there, um, and and didn't ultimately end up going to UVA. Um, and I think maybe that's sort of a testament to the impression um, that you can make on someone, and and how Ted does that so precisely with everyone who crosses his path. I crossed his path for thirty minutes as an applicant, and that was perhaps the last time I saw him in person, and that was probably in two thousand six. Um, and he has had the most profound um, effect. Um, on my career and, and my way of thinking and my approach to patients, um, approach to raising my kids, approach to family. I mean, that's sort of the depth of just the discussions as text uh, or as Jeff alluded to in these text conversations we get where it starts about the podcast, but they're so intentional, every sort of interaction. Um, and it's texting again, you know, it, Ted, that's sort of his preferred <laughs> method. <laughs> I think he has this mental Rolodex where we all who are fortunate enough to sort of be his his sort of in in this group of colleagues um you know we get these random texts and, it, and it's so intentional but we'll be talking about the podcast and the next thing you know it's sort of about don't be too hard on yourself as a parent but oh by the way make sure you get home in time and don't miss anything and you know it's really just the lessons are 
are everywhere. Um, you know, and, and clearly he has changed uh, my career over texting, you know, for somebody um, who, who I've not really seen in person. Certainly we've We've all not seen a lot of people in person for the past couple of years, but it's a long time. So, um, and yeah, the plug for the podcast, um, we're going to get to hear from Barbara a, a little bit, um, but she also graciously agreed to be interviewed for the podcast. And that episode is going to come out tomorrow. So for those of you who aren't, um, who haven't ever subscribed to, to the Neurology Podcast, it's, it's really quite easy. You can go on the web and just Google Neurology Podcast and type in Barbara's name, um, or you just go in that little app, you know, on the phone and, and you download it and, and it'll pop up. Um, this audience may particularly, you know, like some of the episodes, um, you know, the, the one on Barbara, I think is fantastic. And I learned a lot, um, but we try to um, not only talk about neurology topics and, and precisely how it's going to change how we care for patients, but really talk a lot too about um, in, within those interviews about how it's going to change our patients' lives. What does it mean to the patient in, in really every interview? Um, that we do. But yeah, tomorrow's the one with Barbara, um, coincidentally timed. <laughs> um, so we're really excited about that. Um, but yeah, that's, that's all I have. I, I, I don't want to keep talking because, because there's so much, so much that I want you to hear from Barbara that I got to hear already when, when we spoke for the podcast. All right. Well, thanks. I remember to unmute. I almost lost it there. So um, if I can go through a whole Zoom without forgetting to unmute, the pandemic will be officially over, I think. So uh, great, uh, great anecdotes, uh, Stacey. I think all of us who work with TED are familiar with the very, very long text without typographical errors. So um, why don't we pivot and, and introduce Dr. Geyser. So Dr. Geyser is the third uh, TED Birds Humanism and Neurology Award recipient. And um, I've known Barbara for, we were talking a little bit ahead of time. I look back, Barbara, I think it's 11 years now since we did that NeuroLearn thing together. And I remember being impressed with her when we first met in many of the same ways I've been impressed with Ted over the years and really her patient-centeredness. And I, I could go over her academic pedigree, but it would be even longer than what I've done. And I really want to spend a tremendous amount of time. Suffice it to say, she's an extremely accomplished, internationally renowned expert in multiple sclerosis. She spent most of her career at UCLA and rose through the ranks to be a professor and vice chair of the department and has published widely and, and on and on and on. But I think what really distinguishes her are the same things that distinguishes uh, or that distinguishes Ted from, um, from someone who maybe has an equally impressive academic pedigree but hasn't had the impact. And I thought maybe what I'd do is just read the brief synopsis from the nominations committee. And then I'd, I'd like to call on one of the folks who nominated her to make a, a couple of comments as we begin the conversation. But here's the summary from the nominations committee. And this is, uh, you know, um, a committee that is uh, the, led by Stacy Clardy, actually. And so uh, Dr. Geister displays a humanism that is unparalleled and captures the essence of what it means to be a caring mentor, educator, and healthcare provider. She's a nationally recognized advocate for MS education and awareness and is lauded by colleagues, patients, and students for a patient-centered approach. She uh, embodies the aims of the Ted Burns Award to celebrate neurologists whose work embodies humanism and patient care, education, advocacy, and very importantly, everyday encounters. And I think that they are referring to not only patient encounters, but colleagues and uh, others in her life. And so um, um, I think Kelly uh, Montazzi is on. I think your video is on. I saw you a moment ago. Yeah, you're right in the upper left. And uh, you're, you're one of Barbara's nominators. Could you could tell us a little bit about Dr. Geyser? Oh yeah, well that'll that'll take too long. But uh, <laughs> I think anyone who knows Barbara knows how special she is. I've been fortunate enough to know her for twenty years. I was just counting, I guess, when I when I started as a resident with her. And um, I think something that's special about Barbara is that she kind of reminds you why you got into medicine in the first place. Which I mean, we all got into medicine to take care of patients and to connect with them on a special level. But sometimes that can be lost. I think in your training, you know, when you're just trying to learn the ins and outs of how to be a doctor. And, how to take care of the patients. You kind of forget the why or, or what you're trying to do, what you're trying to really achieve. And she was really just someone that struck me when I was a resident and a fellow and beyond because she embodies that every day. You know, she brings it to work every day, not just for the patients, but for her colleagues, which is really important and also really unusual, I think. Um, she always takes care of the whole patient not just their disease modifying therapy for MS, but for everything, which for our MS patients could be pretty lengthy. 
Um, as you know, those are those are complicated patients, and she's not done until the patient has everything that they need and, and every question answered. And um, and so I always found that very special. And she was such a um, a mentor and a guide for me personally and professionally. And she's won a lot of awards, obviously for teaching and for humanism at UCLA. But to see her. Um, I guess, nationally recognized for her efforts is amazing for all of her work that she's done for patients and families with MS. So thank you, Barbara. Thank you. And then I, I want to uh, maybe ask one other person to, to talk a little bit about Barbara before we would let Barbara talk, which we need to do. That's what it's all about. But uh, Nancy Sycott is, is with us. I think I see your video here. So Dr. Sycott, maybe you could uh, contribute a little bit, talk about Dr. Geyser. Well, thank you, Gordon, and thank you, Stacy, for cluing me into uh, tonight's event when it was starting. I'm, I'm here on the East Coast, but um, I just want to uh, congratulate Barbara and congratulate the uh, foundation for choosing someone like her so well deserving of this. And, you know, the thing about people like Barbara, who I've known now for over 20 years as well, when she first came to UCLA is when we met, you know, she's in the trenches every day and sometimes doesn't get recognized. People like this who have made a difference, not just for a day or a year, but for decades. And even before the time that I've known her, if you look back, uh, Barbara has been in the field, I don't, Barbara, I don't wanna say how many, how many years, but um, she's been so impactful over her career. And I, I think it's wonderful that you're recognizing her. And she really is the whole package. She's a mensch of the highest order. And she's taught me most of the Yiddish I know, which is not too much, but um, she's, she just embodies what it is to be a caring physician. She's an amazing educator. We shared a fellowship uh, at one point and uh, our first fellow, uh, Marwa Casey has gone on to have a very successful career working with me at Cedars, but um, I know she considers Barbara her, her mentor as well. She's won awards for her teaching. Uh, patients absolutely adore her and follow her wherever she goes and talk about her uh, is in the most um, loving tones and uh, she provides outstanding care. She's a researcher. She has done incredible work in the rehab area. She directed the, um, the Marilyn Hilton Achievement Center which um, also embodies what um, Callie was saying about uh, treating the whole patient giving the patients a place to go and really thrive. And in all that she does, she's unfailingly joyful and fun to work with and never has a mean thing to say about anyone. And she's just a really special friend and colleague. And I feel very, very honored to be her friend and, uh, and to live in the same city with her. And um, hopefully we'll spend some, some good time together. So. Congratulations, Barbara, for your wonderful career, for everything you've done for so many people. And thank you to the American Brain Foundation for uh, honoring her. Good, good job. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Barbara, maybe we can let you introduce yourself. We spent a lot of time talking about you, but, and I, there, I've got a lot of things I'd love to talk about, and I know Stacy does too, but um, maybe you can introduce yourself and make some uh, some comments and reflections based on what we've already already heard. I, well, thank you. My, my first thought is after these incredibly generous and gracious comments, anything I say is going to be anticlimactic. Um, I, I, first, of all, I'd like to certainly thank the American Brain Foundation and and the AAN for honoring me with this. This is um. When, when you look at all that, that Ted Burns has done to be even considered in the same category, somebody such as he is, is absolutely amazing. I, I think the, the most important part of this award, though, uh, other than honoring Ted Burns, is not the individual recipient, but that the award exists, that the ABF and, and the AAN and you and Stacy had the vision to recognize how important humanism is, and um, especially now. It, it occurred to me when I saw the title Humanism in Neurology that, that we want humanism to be part of any medical um, entity, but the brain is kind of what makes us human. So if, if you can't have humanism in neurology, where, where are you going to have it? Um, as, as you saw, I have been so fortunate to have such incredibly 
gracious and generous and, and wonderful colleagues and students and um, patients. Um, if I've given anything to the field, I have gotten back so much more. So uh, I'm really privileged to get to do what I do, which is be a neurologist and uh, getting recognized for it is, is really lag nap. You've got to tell, you've got to tell everyone, because I, I got the sneak preview from the podcast, but how you even got into neurology. I love that story. Uh, so um, I, uh, when, when I was a, a kid, we had a family friend who was a neurologist and I, uh, and probably a lot, what would now be a gross hip of violation. He let me follow him around on wards in the hospital. And I thought, this is pretty cool. I'm going to be a neurologist. And then when I got to medical school, I actually got seduced by internal medicine. And I thought, I'm going to be a, a, an internal medicine uh, doctor. And, and I was in an internal medicine residency. And long about April of my internship year, when I decided that the neurology cases were much more interesting than the heart failures and the bleeding ulcers. And it turned out that I never could learn to read an EKG anyway. Um, I, I wandered into the neurology uh, department chairman's office, just sort of inquiring if, if they had any need for somebody who wanted to defect over to neurology. And it turned out that week, one of their incoming residents had, had dropped out of the program and they had a slot. And um, here I am. Um, I, I also got into multiple sclerosis sort of by accident when I was a resident. I, I trained at Albert Einstein, which was the home of the first MS Comprehensive Care Center, uh, the MS Research and Training Center. And uh, along about the end of my residency, the, the director, the man who was my mentor, Dr. Labe Scheinberg, um, offered me a job. And I wasn't particularly interested in MS, but I needed a job. And I thought, OK, I'll do this for a year or two until something better comes along. And Nancy was kind enough not to say it, but I will. 40 years later, I'm, I'm still doing it. And uh, I, I can't imagine doing anything else. I think you broke some child labor laws, it sounds like, uh, Barbara. <laughs> um, maybe we can start. I, um, um, uh, you, you, you've kind of described, uh, and others have described the, the impact of humanism in kind of day-to-day -day life or patient encounters, right? And, it, it, and, and, and Nancy talked about this in the training program, right? That it's not merely the clinical acumen, diagnostic skills uh, you know, facility with the now, I think 30 or 40 MS drugs that we have, um, but it's the human touch or the human side of the patient that you referred to earlier when we talked. Can you talk a little bit about that and the, uh, you know, your approach to that, the, the view of it? maybe advice for other people on how to approach this? Um, I, I'd like to start off with a, a quote from, from my husband. We were at to dinner one night with some people who were not doctors and they said, what does a neurologist do? And my husband, who's a physician, but not a neurologist, very helpfully piped up. Neurologist is somebody who treats diseases you wouldn't wanna have. The, the point being that neurologic disease is really scary. And a lot of the, the diseases that we deal with are, are just terrifying. And I think MS, because it's so unpredictable, is a good example of that. And, and MS uh, strikes young people. So you've got people, they're starting careers and families or, or whatever they're doing. And all of a sudden you're telling them, well, you've got MS and um, we can't tell you exactly what's going to happen. And certainly now we can treat it. But um, it's a very, very scary position to begin with. And so my approach to the patient, I think, is because we've all been patients, doctors are immortal, and we've all been patients, how would I want to be approached? What do I want to hear? How am, am I going to phrase whatever I have to tell the person in a way that's going to try to give them information and alleviate their anxiety, and, and most importantly, empower them to, to kind of get past their diagnosis? So I, I think it really begins with putting yourself in, in the patient's shoes and, and not to be reductionist, but it's, it's really the golden rule. You know, how would you want to receive this news? I, I think the other very important, uh, the, the fundamental skill, and um, this is, I think, one of the main things we try to impart to our trainees and, and the successful ones are the ones who know how to listen. And, you know, Osler said, listen to the patient. And, and um, 
on the one hand, you know, listening, getting information to the patient is kind of a self-serving thing because we're not going to be able to help them unless we get the information from them. So um, on, on the one hand, we, we, we listen to the patient to get information so we can do our job, but we all want to be listened to. Um, every, everybody has a story. Patients have a story. And our skill and our obligation to them is to let them tell that story. Um, in, in my religion, the, the quintessential prayer, the most important prayer begins with listen. And so if we can teach people how to listen, I, I think we've done our job. Um, so I, I've, I've got a question and then I wanna um, kind of open it up for a couple of uh, comments, but um, you, you also have an education interest, Barbara, that's how we got to know one another. And I'm, I'm curious, um, uh, you speak as though these skills are teachable skills. It's not just that you're born a good listener or you're, you know, to use the term of the evening, born a humanist, but it's something you can learn to do. Can you talk about that and how your perspective about patient care has informed your, your teaching and, and, and mentorship of students, fellows, residents? Um, I, I think certainly you, you can acquire this skill. You can, some people are going to be better at it than others. But um, I think you certainly can. I mean, we, 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 when we train people, you know, basic skills, we teach people how to take a history. And, and there's a, the first level, you know, like sort of the milestones, the, the neurology milestones have five levels and there's beginner and, and reporter and, and master. So the, the very basic level is just getting that information. And I think as you um, evolve, you um, learn how to build on, on the facts and find out exactly how is the patient feeling? How is the patient affected by this? Um, and, and that's where the, the joy of education comes in. Um, and one of the joys of, of being an educator and getting to work with patients, because every time we step in a room where we're teaching, but getting to work with patients and students and, and uh, residents and fellows is that they inform you. They're, the way that, that they're receiving the information and informs you how to do it. Stephen Sondheim likes to tell a story. His mentor, of course, was Oscar Hammerstein. And, and he wanted to grow up to, to be a composer because he wanted to be like Oscar Hammerstein. And he said, Oscar Hammerstein gave him an autographed picture and it said to Stevie, my friend and teacher. And so all of the, the people that I've had the privilege of mentoring, they've, they've been my teachers. I think the way you do this is model. I think one of the, the best things about medicine, about neurology is technology notwithstanding, it's, it's a journey or journey personship. It's an apprenticeship. You learn by seeing others. Uh, and so at the end of the day, I think the best way to do that is to model the behavior. Yeah, and I, I, that's such a great point. And I, I think it also applies to patients. We learn from our patients as well. And I, I want to um, ask, I think Carol Bender is on now. And, and Carol, I wonder if you'd be willing to make a few comments. You know Dr. Geiser from a different perspective, and I think you, you'll have some interesting things to say about this conversation. So I found you, you're here. So if you're open for it, would you mind unmuting? And maybe you can talk a little bit about Dr. Geiser and this topic. Yes. <laughs> can you hear me? Uh, yeah, uh, to wonderful. Start yes. the video too, but let's see. Oops. Ah, okay, here I am. All right. here I am. Yes, um, Dr. Geyser has been my um, MS neurologist now for 17 years. <laughs> and she will always, as long as she's practicing, she will always be my MS uh, neurologist. So I was first, um, I got symptoms in uh, 2005. I had burning numbness, tingling in the bottom of my left foot had an MRI, it maybe was, maybe wasn't, and a neurologist referred me to her to kind of figure this out. So I went to see her up at uh, UCLA and I also worked there. And what I loved about her, when I went in, she pulled up the MRI and she says, let's look at this together. Um, so again, she was showing me and pointing out and she said, yes, I, I think you really do have, you know, a mild case of, uh, you know, MS. And, and then she was telling me uh, what it was and then about different drugs and stuff. So she gave me information to take home. And what I really just love about her as, as my doctor is 
um, she never makes a decision by herself. It's all, she's very patient oriented. And we looked at things together. She'd go read the material and then we'll discuss about, you know, medications and, and what, you know, recommended. So it was a, a joint decision-making process. So this was so many years ago, I went on Copaxone and uh, that, that was, that was my drug, and and uh, you know for years, you know years and years and years, and um, you know I did I did well on it, and I always you know went to you know went to see her, and occasionally I would have you know an exacerbation, more tingling, and then oh once or twice I got horrible case of itching all over. I thought I was going to have to join a nudist colony. I couldn't, I couldn't put, I couldn't put on, you know, something, you know, over here. And uh, she said, yeah, I'm going to, you know, and she, you know, gave me um, the, um, uh, you know, the injections and, and a nurse came and, you know, for three days and it worked like a charm. So at least I knew if that came again, there was something that would, um, you know, help me. And, you know, I, I lived my life, you know, to the fullest. And what I really feel about MS, it's a part of me, but it's not all of me. It doesn't describe all of who, who I am. Um, and uh, so I wrote a letter for her when she was being con considered for this award. I said, of course, I'll write a letter because I mean, I just think she's so patient, um, you know, oriented. And it was funny, you know, for, and I was at the MS Achievement Center. I went to the initial thing, you know, where it, I mean, it was 10 or 15 weeks about for newly diagnosed patients. Then I took exercise classes there for years and years. And it was just wonderful, wonderful staff, wonderful people. And then, of course, I'd said, I knew she was going to, quote, retire one day from UCLA, but I knew those UCLA professors, they always keep patients, you know, some. So I said to her, well, when you retire, can I be one of those patients that you keep? And she said, of course, Carol. And then a couple of years ago, she sends me this thing, I'm retiring. And so I email it back. I said, but of course, I'm going to be one of those patients that you keep. And then she's but I'm not going to be practicing at UCLA. And I was, I, you know, I just about had an anxiety attack. And then she told me that she was going over to the Pacific, you know, Neuro Center to start a new program on, an, on MS. And I could see her there. I said, and I live in Santa Monica. I said, I am following you. And uh, I have continued to see her. And the thing I like about her, and then I'll be quiet and give other people time, she's just always available. If I have a question about something, I can call her. And it's like she's at her computer just waiting for me. And then the time came where, um, you know, the injections were bothersome. Sometimes they work, something. That, and I, I said to her, and I was older, I said, what do you think about um, my possibly stopping the Copaxone injections? I also take gabapentin, um, you know, which I have continued for the numbness and tingling. The only symptom I have basically is numbness and tingling on the bottom of my left foot. I can do everything. I play tennis weekly. So, uh, you know, I'm lucky in that, in that sense. But, um, and then she agreed, she said, well, let's try, you know, get off, you know, get, get off of the Copaxone. And I have been off of it now for a number of years with no problems. And the gabapentin, you know, I still take. So Dr. Geyser, you are the best. And as long as you practice, I have, I have appointment with her the end of March. And then I got, I'm just thinking me tomorrow night, I'm going to be in the, you know, the MRI machine with three MRIs and whatever, but I close my eyes and I just, see myself in a beautiful place. So thank you, thank you, thank you. You are so deserving of this award. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. And I think I saw when you signed it, Carol, you're your social worker, is that right? Yes, I'm a, I'm a licensed clinical, I'm happily retired now, but a licensed clinical social worker and also an attorney. So the other thing that I've been involved with Dr. Geyser, you know, the, the, uh, there's a mental health um, advocacy committee part of the uh, MS Society Council. And I'm on that with her. And the other thing I want to say that I think it was also important, a number of years ago, I, um, I suggested that there be a telephone counseling program for people with MS, where they could talk to you know, a therapist. And again, the MS Society, they agreed. And then I said to the person, and I want to be one of the clinicians. They said, of course, Carol, we'll even give you the first client. And um, I did that for a number of years. And it was just um, wonderful to do. And they even pay, you know, that the patients got it free, you know, they got their therapy free. 
and the clinicians, we even got paid and, you know, could do it at home. So again, there's so much um, available and she's so deserving. And that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think patients are probably the toughest critics and then a social worker, you know, that, that carries some weight because you can usually see right to the heart of what's going on <laughs> and what someone's thinking. <laughs> thank you. So Carol, can I ask you a question? Sure. So I think one of the things I, 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 I caught in your really excellent summary was um, the great team that Barbara works with. UCLA is a great place, tons of great people there. Um, but I think what certainly we've talked about Ted and the impact that he has on the people around him. And I'm a much better person from working with Ted. And I think Stacy made a similar comment. I'm curious your observation of uh, Dr. Geiser's impact on the team she's working with, and you've, I'm sure, seen other doctors and their teams. Can you, have, can you talk a little bit about that, you know, how sure. she impacts I mean, the people around her? Yeah, I mean, there was a real team spirit there uh, between Dr. Geiser, um, Elise um, Hurley, who was the nurse and was just fabulous, is now happily retired, and then uh, the uh, physical therapist, the occupational therapist, you know, the exercise person, that they would meet together and, and work out who was going to do, um, you know, what. And then when COVID came, like, well, what was going to happen to some of this? And then they even did uh, some of the exercise program online so that we were at home. But, you know, one of the things she's always said is that exercise is so important. And I believe she's right about that, because I think for me, exercise, you know, just, um, it's so, so important. And it really just feeds the brain and feeds the body. And um, so, but, but she is absolutely a team player and, and you could always uh, go to her and, and the team members did, and they worked, they worked together. They shared information. And that's so important because sometimes uh, a client, a patient will tell one person something and maybe not share it, but it's important. And how do you get that information shared in a way that will be helpful uh, to the patient? Because really the patient needs to come first. That's, that's, I think, what it's all about. Well, thanks for joining us. That, that's really great. And please keep talking and others, please <laughs> feel free to chime in. This is uh, open, open game. So, uh, you know, raise your hand, unmute. Or, or put something in the, the chat if you like. Uh, Barbara, I can turn it back to you. And uh, I think there's another recurring theme that's come up and it came up in what Carol just talked about. And that's uh, your mentorship of the people around you. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? We, we, we talked earlier about the, the potential that, to teach, to, to, to help learners um, develop a humanism skills, but talk a little bit more about mentorship, if you will, because that's a bit of a different thing. It's something that clearly is, has come up as a strength of yours. Um, well, I, I was very lucky. My, my mentor, as I said, was uh, one of the, the great men of MS of the 20th century, a man named Leib Scheinberg, who did back in the 60s and 70s and 80s, before we had disease modifying therapy, before we knew that exercise was good for before we knew that pregnancy was good for people with MS. And um, he really pioneered this concept of comprehensive care and using a team and treating the whole person. And um, I, I was very fortunate to learn from him. So, and again, it was, it was uh, you know, just a, a, a very, um, I watched him. I watched him do his thing, and I listened to him, and I learned from him. So, as I say, I think that the main part of of mentorship is modeling, and um, encouraging people to to take risks, encouraging people to stress themselves, uh, stretch themselves. Um, I've been fortunate. I've had um, uh, incredible trainees. You you've heard from from one of them. I've had incredible colleagues whom you've also heard from, like my friend Nancy Sycott, who's one of the premier um, mentors in neurology, and yourself, uh, I Knights of the Exemplar. So I think that's one of the things I love about our profession is that there are so many people in it that you can draw from and learn from. So Gordon, I wanted to just jump in uh, since you opened it up a little bit and, and make a few comments, because um, I think this is such a 
important area and a, an area where we don't really talk about like what makes a good neurologist over the long haul. And, and I think, um, and Barbara exemplifies this, but I think one of the, the pieces is that you really have to like people. And I know that may sound crazy because we're all in the helping field and we, you know, take care of patients, but there's a certain joy uh, that you see in Barbara and in others who really like to take care of patients um, that is just liking to get to know another person. And, and I think that's something when you talk about trainees, it's really hard to give them that uh, kind of perspective, but I think it's the key because you approach then each of your encounters as an opportunity to get to know someone and to know who they are and, and know what makes them tick. Um, and then and respect that and 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 you know feel it's like a, you have this great um, it's a great honor to be with people in their most difficult times, and and we get to do that and then we get to walk this journey with them, and I think that part of the mentorship it takes time to see that I think and it takes time. I think trainees are really anxious about, you know, learning all the protocols and finding the right drugs and doing everything right. And, but at the end of the day, what the patient's experience is a good clinical encounter. Of course, you need that expertise, but then you need that other je ne sais quoi. And, uh, and I think that Barbara has that. And, and I think it's obvious because Barbara's still doing this 40 years. Is it really 40 years, Barbara? Uh, but she just loves uh, taking care of patients. And uh, so I, I don't know, Gordon, can we instill that? Uh, how do we do that for, for our trainees? Um, and I'll add one more comment that I think we need to make sure they don't burn out. Because I think when people are burnt out, that's the first, that's the thing that goes, right? That, that, uh, that joy that, uh, that you get. Uh, so I think as, you know, more senior people, we need to watch out for that and, and try and protect our, our young trainees. If, if I can build on what my friend Dr. Sykat has so eloquently said, that's, that's why it's so amazing that, that this award exists because it, 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 Nancy addressed burnout. This, you know, everything in the world, I mean, we've got COVID and wars and, and all kinds of Sturm and Drang going on. And we've had this whole revolution in medicine. We've had this whole technical revolution. And um, as, as Nancy alluded to, our trainees may be so focused on clicking the right box in the electronic medical record so they can get on and write the order and sign off on the note and get on to their next thing, that they've forgotten that at the end of the day, we're dealing with with patients, we're dealing with with people, not electrons, and so that's why this this award is is more important than than the individual. It's that this is a quality not only to be celebrated, but to be cherished, and and um, it, it's an essential part of what we do. Yeah, I said, Nancy, I think you raised the existential moment of our time or po topic of our time, which is engagement and burnout, which is a huge issue. And I, um, I'm, re I'm always reminded of Terry Casino's comment that volunteerism and engagement is a, um, is a protective uh, um, uh, activity or a, well, he'll use the term anecdote. And uh, I'd like to, we, we're running out of time. I really want to talk about advocacy a bit. And I I see someone called iPhone Jason, which I think is Jason Crowell. <clears throat> and if that's Jason, I wonder if you could take just a few minutes, because I, I want Barbara to talk about this, but Jason and I have spent a lot of time in advocacy working with Ted, and maybe you could talk a little bit about the impact that Ted has had uh, on you in terms of advocacy and how that in turn has led to fulfillment in your career. And you don't at all look burned out to me. So maybe you can speak to that. But for those of you who don't know, uh, Jason is a movement disorder neurologist. He actually has an MPA and healthcare policy from the Kennedy School at, at Harvard. So he's the real deal. But uh, Jason, maybe you can make a few comments about advocacy and maybe the relationship to you know, um, professional fulfillment that Nancy was talking about. And then, and Barbara, I'd love for you to talk more about your advocacy work because it's really very impressive. And Jason, if that's you, you're, you're muted. I guess the pandemic is still on for a little bit longer here. He's trying, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm busy trying to mute myself. 
<laughs> you know, I'll jump in there and say <laughs> one thing I wanted to say, because I know we are going to run out of time before we get into the advocacy. You know, um, when we review, I mean, it's so fun to review the applications that, that come in for this, but I will say it's almost like the sorting hat, right? Tremendously accomplished colleagues are, are nominated for this pages and pages of CVs, but it just becomes immediately obvious who it is, you know, just as it was with Barbara, but we still vet, we still do our homework and, and we dig around uh, and we nose around it and we find out people you've trained and Barbara, the things that were said, and I, the one that really struck me was the shortest comment um, that I got. And it was over a text. I said, Hey, you, you, you know, you, you worked with Dr. Geiser a bit, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. And the person really just wrote back one sentence and said, I am a neuroimmunologist because of Barbara Geiser, period. Right? I was like, okay, I think we're done. I think we could call that sort of due diligence. But it looks like Jason worked out, worked out the technique. Can you hear me? Yep, we can. Here I am. Thanks, uh, Gordon. And um, congratulations to you, uh, Barbara. I apologize for joining us late. You know, Ted, um, one of the qualities about him that always strikes me that's just so fascinating is the, the ability he has to recognize the broader role that we have as neurologists, not just in taking care of the patient in front of us, but really taking care of kind of patients at large, right? So Ted and uh, Gordon and I have, have talked a lot and, and tried to do a lot about um, drug pricing and raise awareness about financial toxicity of, of expansion medications. And Ted, just a few weeks ago, was just in a rapid fire text message threads talking about this new term that he, that he wants to popularize. Cause we, we often talk about out of pocket costs, but he, he was making the point that that doesn't quite capture the cost to society at large, kind of the hidden cost um, that, that comes out of all of our pockets collectively, you know, in, in higher co-pays and higher taxes when, when drugs are overpriced. And so he got super excited about the idea of an, of an out of community cost. So not just our out-of-pocket, but out-of-community, the, the idea being that money is being lost, um, being, being spent kind of at a, at a societal level. And I give that just as an example to, to talk about Ted's enthusiasm for um, recognizing that, yes, we are individual practitioners taking care of individual, individual patients, but collectively we have uh, a, a responsibility to um, be good stewards of healthcare resources that are finite. Um, and so that, that's something that Ted uh, has uh, an, an interest that Ted has inspired in me and sparked in me. Um, and I know in many others. So um, I just wanted to point that out when, when I, when I think about advocacy and I think about this award, you know, there, there's been great things said about the, uh, the importance of education and, and teaching residents and trainees, but I think also wrapped up in that is the importance of recognizing um, kind of the collective responsibility that we have to be good stewards of, of healthcare resources. And, and drug pricing is certainly something that Ted has put his stamp on. Thanks, Jason. I, I want to comment briefly on a comment. And then I see Dorita Berger has her hand up. I'm sorry if I missed that for a while. Uh, so um, perhaps you can unmute. I'd love to hear your comment. But uh, I'd like everyone to read, I don't know the name, but 5663888. It provides a, I think a more typical patient encounter in our healthcare system regarding bad news on Christmas Eve and the way it was delivered. And I, I think it, it offers a, perhaps a, a foil to Barbara's flame uh, and Ted's flame, because it's, uh, I think, something we commonly see and is what we really need to try to prevent. And, you know, uh, the, this, uh, this friend has talked about the need to teach new neurologists how to deliver uh, bad news, which is critically important. But uh, Dorita, uh, the, 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 the Zoom is yours. Thank you. Um, I'm a professional PhD music therapist clinician um, that works with Parkinson's people and have done a lot of research on the brain and music and so forth. And I would like to add that humanism is a talent. And in order to have a humanistic approach in anything, a person 
has to be a mensch, as, as we say. And in med medical education, I propose consistent, continuous opportunity for medical students to explore themselves before they can even understand another. And in order to do that through poetry or music or whatever coursework they can have amidst all of their training so that the human being never forgets the self in order to understand the other. Thank you. Such great comments, Dorita, thank you. Um, I think we're running short on time. So Barbara, I, let me maybe have you comment on whatever you'd like. I, I, you know, advocacy, so many things. Maybe you can close it out with a few comments that can inspire us. Um, I thank you. I, I I don't know that I can add very much to what's been said by the very eloquent speakers on on this conversation. Uh, Ms. Berger's comments are very well taken, and she may know that there are medical schools that do in fact have curricula for for self reflective um, uh, insights. Uh, students and trainees are encouraged to to share stories, write poems, write essays, and I think this is a great trend and and should continue. I'll, I'll just make another small plug for advocacy since Jason brought it up. Um, as I said, we're advocates. Every time we step in a room and suggest a, a treatment or, a, or a, a therapeutic maneuver for a patient, we're advocating. And so it's not such a big leap from doing that in our, in our exam rooms to, to doing it in, in a legislator's office. When they see legislation, you know, they mostly see the, the financial cost. So, you know, this, this bill is going to cost $8 billion to do such and such. And what our responsibility is, is to go in and show them what the human costs are. Um, I, I got into advocacy with the National MS Society, I think almost 30 years ago, we, we got to go up to Capitol Hill and they paired um, neurologists with people who had MS. And when you, when you go to a legislator's office and they see what the, the human toll is, what the disease does, and why funding for research is going to impact uh, an individual person or funding to make medication accessible is going to impact on the individual level. It's really powerful. Um, if you have time to go to Capitol Hill or your state legislator, great. But if you've got three minutes to email your legislature, that's advocacy. If you write a letter to the newspaper about pending legislation, that's advocacy. If you you teach a trainee uh, about pending legislation and how to, that's advocacy. So um, obviously I'm, I'm pretty passionate about this, but I think it's something that's easy to do. And I think it's one of our responsibilities. Well, I think we're out of time and I, I'm gonna go back to Nancy's point. I think this this prevents you from being burned out because you, you can be very successful and have impacts not only on individuals, but populations and communities. So I think, I think we're at the hour. Um, I, I, I don't know, Jane, I'd love to keep going, but um, wow. I, I think that we probably need to wrap it up. Uh, okay. Thanks everyone. Barbara, congratulations. Very, very well deserved. I think that's obvious in your comments tonight and the comments of the people who, um, who've aggregated around you over, over the years. Um, I, um, I wanna thank the ABF and thank Jane uh, in particular and others from the ABF. Uh, Jane did put in the chat for those of you who are inspired and would like to contribute to the, uh, to the Ted Burns Award, there's a link to do so. And if, um, if uh, you don't catch that link or you lose it, just go to the website, AmericanBrainFoundation.org, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, did I get that right? Um, that and right. Uh, you can find it there. And I, I hope to see many of you in Seattle at the AAN meeting. But thank you very much. And thanks, Stacy, for the hard work of, of uh, selecting such amazing people for the award. And I hope everyone has a, a wonderful evening. And uh, I, I feel energized after this. And I, I want to thank you all. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, thank everybody. You. And uh, congratulations again, Dr. Geiser. Thank you, Stacy and Gordon, for your leadership of the fund. Thanks. Good night, everybody. Us.